Hello and welcome to Breaking Down Bad Books, a podcast analysing trashy bestsellers from a literary perspective. And today we're looking at chapter 24 of Fifty Shades of Grey. So where we left off, Christian and Anna had period sex and then they went to bed. And so we start this chapter with her in a dream sequence. E.L. James loves a dream sequence and Christian standing in a cage and he's just wearing jeans and he's holding out a strawberry and telling Anna to eat it. And Anna's pulling forward, leaning forward, trying to eat the strawberry, but she's restrained, but she doesn't know what she's restrained to. So she's thinking, let me go, let me go. But she wants to scream, but she can't because there's no sound emerging. She's mute. And then eventually she starts to hear Anastasia, come on, baby, wake up. And she's thinking, no, no, I want to touch you. I want to lean forward and eat that strawberry. But then she wakes up. What a pointless exercise that was. Was anyone interested in that little dream? But she's waking up and she's thinking, oh, I'm in bed and someone is nuzzling my ear. And then the voice whispers, wake up, baby. And then she says, it's Christian. And no fucking shit. Who else would it have been? Who else would it have been, Anna? Is it your mum's boyfriend, Bob? No. And she is just resisting waking up. But he's like, come on, baby. I want to chase the dawn with you. And then he starts kissing her face and kissing her eyelids and the tip of her nose and her mouth. And I'm like, ugh, it's too much. Stop kissing people's eyelids. And then she sees that he's looking at her and he's smiling. He's amused, amused at her. Dressed, exclamation mark, in black, full stop. What what is this sentence structure? We're just getting one or two word sentences with a full stop and then one word with an exclamation at the end. I mean, punctuation's nice and all, but sometimes you just got to have a sentence that's longer than two words. So then she whinges that she was having such a nice dream and he was like, oh, what about? And she says, you were trying to feed me strawberries and his lips twitch with a trace of a smile. Like, would it hurt him to just smile? Like, just smile, just full out smile. Why you gotta have your lips twitch with a trace of a smile? Just smile. And he says, Dr. Flynn could have a field day with that, as in analyzing her dream. (laughs) Trying to feed me strawberries, I don't get it. Maybe Dr. Flynn could share with the rest of the class because I don't get the, the implication there. I don't know what that means. And he says, come on, get dressed. Don't bother to shower. We can do that later. And she thinks, we, exclamation mark. So she's still carrying on about how tired she is. And she says, what time is it? And he says, it's 5.30 in the morning. And she says, feels like 3 a.m. And well, yeah, because you're in a different time zone. It's called jet lag. It's not a new phenomena. So she clambers out of bed, always clambering. And he's like laid out her clothes for the day on a chair and folded them. And there's a pair of his Ralph Lauren jersey boxer briefs for her to wear. So she slips them on and he grins at her. So not just a trace of a grin, it's a full blown grin, thank God. And then she's thinking about the strawberry scene from Tess of the Duberville. So, okay. The strawberry scene must be a legit thing. But then she says, it evokes my dream. But then she says, to hell with Dr. Flynn. Freud would have a field day. And then he'd probably expire trying to deal with Fifty Shades. She really thinks there's, there's something to this strawberry dream. She really thinks there's something to it. Okay, so I figured I should look up the Tess of the Dubervilles strawberry scene. I call myself a literary guy, but I'm just not familiar with the source material. Sorry, AL. So apparently in their first introduction, Alec insists on placing a strawberry into Tessa's mouth, causing her slight distress and foreshadowing his unwanted advances later in the novel. So the description of the consumption of the strawberry against perhaps better moral instinct on Tessa's part invokes the imagery of Eve and the apple, but in reverse. So by force feeding Tess strawberries, uh, it's all about Alec being self-serving and controlling and projecting his own cravings and inclinations onto her. Okay, so what do you mean Freud would have a field day or Dr. Flynn would have a field day? It's pretty obvious what the dream means now, right? I never realized when I started reading Fifty Shades 
how much extra homework I would have to do to understand the content of Fifty Shades of Grey. Like, you don't know how many times I've had to look shit up while reading this book. What's that word mean? What's a flogger? (laughs) What's the strawberries all about? Ugh, she's keeping me on my toes. So then after she gets dressed, Christian's in the hotel room eating breakfast and he says, eat. And she goes, holy Moses, my dream. (laughs) As if it's just not normal for him to tell her to eat. Cause like he's done that 30 times already. But no, now it's, it's directly tied to her dream. And she's like, okay, mate, I know you want me to eat, but it's 5.30 AM. Like I can't stomach a croissant right now. And he's like, oh, fine. And then she's like, oh God, I really want to roll my eyes at you, but I know I can't. And then they have a little bit of flirty banter about that. And she can see the humor lurking in the back of his eyes. She can see the back of his eyes and she can see humor in it. Uh, God, it would be easier if he just smiled. It would be easier to decipher what he thinks is funny and not funny if he just smiled. But whatever, we're just, we're interpreting the back of his eyes. Oh, and he gets her a cup of tea and she notices the twinings label and her heart sings and her subconscious says, see, he does care. Again, so the subconscious is sticking up for Christian. It's a, it's a full 180 from the subconscious. So then they go downstairs. The valet hands him the key to like a convertible. How fun. And then he grins. And then he has a smug conspiratorial grin on his face because he says, you know, sometimes it's great being me. And she thinks, oh, he's so lovable when he's playful and carefree. Like, when has that ever happened? (laughs) He's not been lovable or carefree this whole book, but yeah, okay. So then they're driving to some undisclosed location and they're listening to La Traviata, which is an opera by Verdi. Okay, cool, whatever. Who who does this? Who just listens to operas in the car at 5.30 a.m.? Serial killers. And he says it's based on an Alexander Dumas book, which she's read. And she goes, ah, the doomed courtesan. And then she squirms in the seat and she's like, oh, is he trying to tell me something? (laughs) She's always looking for a literary illusion. And Christian says, oh, well, just play something else on my iPod. So she scrolls through his iPod and she selects the song Toxic by Britney, (laughs) which is just a banger. And then Christian turns it down and she's like, oh, maybe it's too early for this. Britney at her most sultry. And I was like, I'd rather listen to Britney at 6 a.m. than La Traviata. But apparently she wanted him to turn it down because he turns it down and she hugs herself and her inner goddess is standing on the podium awaiting her gold medal. And she thinks victory. Like what? What what a little mind game to play at 6 a.m. But then he casually says, I didn't put that song on my iPod. And she thinks, what, who did, who, who? (laughs) So she thinks, what, who did? And then she thinks, who, dot, 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 who? And then the song ends and she thinks, who, who? And then she stares at the window and she says, who? (laughs) So she sounds like a fucking owl at this point. That is one, two, three, four, five, six who's over four lines. That's a lot of who's. Who, 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 who? (laughs) She's a fucking barn owl. And so then Christian admits that it was Layla. And then he says that Layla was one of the 15 subs. And she's thinking, oh God, it's too early for this kind of convo. But while she thinks that she asks him why they broke up. (laughs) And he says, oh, because she wanted more and I didn't, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, I've never wanted more until I met you. And she gasps and she's reeling. And she thinks, oh my, he wants more. He wants more. (laughs) She's just repeating everything in this chapter. And her inner goddess is backflipped off of the podium she was on earlier and is now doing cartwheels around the stadium. And she says the stadium, like there's a stadium, but ugh. And then she thinks, hmm, he's talking. I better take advantage. So she says, what happened to the other 14? And he goes, you want a list? Divorced, beheaded, died which is a fun little Henry VIII joke. And then he says, okay, I've only had long-term relationships with four women, apart from Elena. And she thinks, Elena. And then she realizes that it's Mrs. Robinson and she thinks, Elena, holy fuck. The evil one has a name and it's all foreign sounding. (laughs) Yeah, because no one in the United States of America is called Elena. 
No, it's foreign. It's foreign. And then she has a vision of her looking like a pale skinned vamp with raven hair and ruby red lips. And she thinks, I must not dwell. I must not dwell. She's seriously repeating everything. But she's loving how much he's talking. So she's just asking more questions. And she's like, well, what happened with the other four? And he says, well, one met someone else and the other three wanted more. And I wasn't in the market for more. And then she says, and the others? And he says, just didn't work out. And she narrates, whoa, a bucket load of information to process. (laughs) And no, it's not. He just said, oh, it didn't work out to describe 10 women. And she's like, whoa, that's a bucket load. (laughs) What? And then eventually he tells her that they're going soaring. And he pulls up outside a large white building with a sign reading Brunswick Soaring Association. (laughs) And so then she figures out, oh, gliding. We're going gliding. (laughs) I don't know how she pieced that together, but okay. And she's full into it. She loves the fact that he's flying. And then he says, another first, Miss Steele. And she thinks, first? What sort of first? First time flying in a glider? Shit. And then she's like, oh no, he said he's done that before. (laughs) She's so dumb. And she says, the sky has turned into a subtle opal, shimmering and glowing softly behind the sporadic childlike clouds. Dawn is upon us. Childlike clouds. What? Does that just mean a small cloud, like a big cloud is an adult sized cloud? What's a childlike cloud? Are we talking about the clouds that are on like the wallpaper in Andy's bedroom in Toy Story? Is like that, is that what a childlike cloud looks like? Those fluffy ones? I'm very confused. Uh, It's another thing I've got to Google. So they go around the corner of the building and there's a large tarmac with lots of planes and waiting for them is a man with a shaved head and a wild look in his eye. (laughs) Oh, what's his backstory? (laughs) That's intriguing. And also Taylor. And then she repeats Taylor exclamation mark. (laughs) Like she was really pushing for the word count on this one. And Taylor says, Mr. Gray, this is your tow pilot, Mr. Mark Benson. And then Taylor says hi to Anna. And then he says, he's been hell on wheels the last few days. Glad we're here. What the hell does that mean? But she goes, oh, this is news. Why? Surely not because of me, exclamation mark. Revelation Thursday, exclamation mark. Must be something in the Savannah water that makes these men loosen up a bit. (laughs) So then Mark Benson, because she keeps referring to him by his full name or just by his surname. She doesn't call him Mark. She just calls him Mark Benson. He walks them around the runway and she's thinking, wow, gliding, exclamation mark. So there's a plane and attached to the plane by a long white cable is another small single propeller plane. And Benson says, first we need to strap on your parachute. And she says, parachute, exclamation mark. Like, I'm not joking. Everything is repeated in this chapter. So then Christian straps her into the parachute because he loves strapping her in and they banter about that. Ha ha ha, hilarious. So she clambers into the plane. (sighs) <sighs> and they get ready to go and she's super excited. She's excited, but her inner goddess, oh, she's under a blanket behind the sofa. <laughs> and he sits behind her because the pilot sits in the back. She says that he's strapped her in so tightly she can't move around to see him. Dot, 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 typical exclamation mark. And it's like, I don't know if that, <laughs> if that was his intention in strapping you in. I think maybe it was a safety thing, but sure. It's, it's so you can't turn around and see him. Also, do you have a neck? Just turn your neck. She's all strapped in. Hun, just turn your neck and, and, and look. And then she says, Mark Benson appears and double checks the straps. Like, <laughs> Just say Mark. <laughs> I mean, we're just treating the bald man with the wild look in his eye very formally, which is just not expected. And as the propeller starts, her nervous stomach relocates itself to her throat. (laughs) So now her stomach's in her throat. And she thinks, geez, I'm really doing this. So the plane towing them that Mark is flying is still on the ground, but going fast, picking up speed. And she thinks, geez, will we ever get up? And then suddenly her stomach disappears from her throat (laughs) and free falls through her body to the ground. So now her stomach's on the ground and she's airborne. (laughs) 
And I don't think it's sudden. Can you really say suddenly I'm in the air when you've been taking off for five minutes? Like that's not sudden. And so they're gliding in the air and she's describing it like it's amazing. They're chasing the dawn. And then the radio says that they're at 3000 feet. She goes, geez, that sounds high. (laughs) Yes, it is high. And then Christian says release. And so I guess the cable between the plane and the propeller jet just drops away. And then they're floating, floating over Georgia. So she says, she says floating twice. She loves a repeat. And then she says they're spiraling towards the sun and she thinks, Icarus, this is it. I'm flying close to the sun, but he's with me, leading me. And she gasps at the realization. Uh, So the Icarus metaphor again. It's just the chapter of metaphors. If the strawberries didn't seal the deal, maybe the literal flying too close to the sun will will clear things up for you. If If you're still wondering if their relationship is on the right path and that they're meant for each other, Pay attention to these metaphors. Christian must have some control over him, even though they're gliding. And he, he spins them upside down and she's like, ah, ha, ha, ha. And then she says, I'm glad I didn't have breakfast, exclamation mark. And he's like, yeah, it's pretty good that you didn't because I'm going to do that again. And then he spins them upside down again. Then he says, see that joystick in front of you? And she's like, oh no, where's he going with this? And he says, grab hold. And she says, oh shit. He's going to make me fly the plane. No, exclamation mark. And he says, go on, grab it. (laughs) And I don't think that's a metaphor. That's not a metaphor. So then she jiggles the joystick and she must be in control of it because she thinks, holy shit, I'm flying a glider. I'm soaring. And she says, I'm amazed you let me take control. And he says, you'd be amazed what I'd let you do. And then I guess they start their descent because they're circling around the airstrip in circles and just getting lower and lower. And then suddenly they're on the ground. (laughs) Again, that's improper use of the word suddenly. She's describing their descent for two paragraphs and then suddenly they're on the ground. Well, no shit, you're on the ground. You were descending. So then Christian opens the cockpit lid and they clamber out. Christian clambers out first. And then he has a quick chat with her and then she clambers out. She couldn't even think of another word. They both had to clamber out. I think I must remind everybody that the definition of clamber is to climb or move in an awkward and laborious way, typically using both hands and feet. (laughs) And they're just clambering all the time. These are the two most awkward people. And it's so annoying because she totally described Bella as being so clumsy and awkward And she's never really tripped over or anything apart from chapter one. But I guess she is clambering a lot. That's the only evidence we have. But he's clambering too. And he's meant to be graceful, but he's Clamber City. (laughs) And I also think I just called her Bella. (laughs) Whoops. Then they're making out in the field where they landed. Just making out and she can feel his erection. But then he pulls away and says, breakfast. But he whispers it, making it sound deliciously erotic. (laughs) And she says, how can he make bacon and eggs sound like forbidden fruit? So let me try that. That one word that sounds erotic. Breakfast. (laughs) Breakfast. Breakfast. (laughs) Uh, Yep. Deliciously erotic. And she says, what about the glider? And he says, someone will take care of that. We'll eat now. And she thinks, food! Exclamation mark. He's talking food. And yes, that's typically what is meant by breakfast. And then he's full on smiling. No trace, no twigs, no ghosts of smiles. He's full on smiling. And she thinks, I've never seen him like this. It's a joy to behold. She says it reminds her of when she was 10 and spending the day at Disneyland with Ray. It was the perfect day. And this is shaping out to be the same. I'd rather be at Disneyland. So then they're back in the car heading towards Savannah. And her phone alarm goes off and she thinks, oh yes, my pill. And she tells Christian, oh, it's an alarm for my pill. And she's flushing. And he says, great, I hate condoms. (laughs) And that makes her flush some more. So what a wonderful little update we got about her being on the pill. And then they pull up to International House of Pancakes. And she says, IHOP. And she thinks, I don't believe it. Who would have thought? Christian Grey at IHOP. So she goes into the restaurant and she says it smells of sweet batter, fried food and disinfectant. And she thinks, hmm, not such an enticing aroma. And as fucking if, it's going to smell of maple syrup if it's going to smell of anything. 
So she picks up a menu and she realizes that she's starving. This always happens. She, she'll always refuse to eat and then discover that she's hungry because she didn't eat. But then they're staring at each other over the menus and he's saying, I know what I want. And she goes, I want what you want. So they're talking about banging and he's like here. And then he's winking at her and she thinks, oh my sex in IHOP. (laughs) Stop saying IHOP. But then he's like, nah, not here, not now. And then this poor waitress, Leandra, she comes over and she's like, hi, my name's Leandra. What can I get for you, uh, folks, uh, today, this morning, uh, and poor Leandra flushes scarlet when she sees how attractive Christian is. Or it could just be because she heard a snippet of their conversation and maybe noticed that he has an erection underneath that menu. That's what I reckon. But then she swallows, praying that she doesn't go the same color as poor Leandra. <laughs> Poor Leandra. She's describing her as poor Leandra. (laughs) Oh, poor Leandra. And she says, I told you I want what you want to Christian. Just ignoring poor Leandra. And her inner goddess is swooning and thinking, am I up to this game? And then Leandra's poor Leandra. She's looking from him to her, to her, to him. And she's like, huh? And apparently she's now the same color as her shiny red hair. So poor Leandra, she's just blush, blush, blushing. And she says, shall I give you folks another minute to decide? And Christian says, no, we know what we want. And then he's smiling a sexy smile. And I'm thinking, poor Leandra doesn't need to hear this at 8.30 a.m. in the morning on the morning shift. It's hard enough to work at an IHOP. He better leave a good tip for what he's putting her through. Poor Leandra. But then he just orders pancakes. (laughs) And poor Leandra says, thank you, will that be all? And then they both turn to stare at her and she flushes crimson again and scuttles away. Poor Leandra. And then this is just dialogue ripped right out of Twilight. She says, you know, it's not really fair. And he says, what's not fair? And she says, how you disarm people, women, me. And he says, do I disarm you? And she says, all the time. And that is the exact conversation that Edward and Bella had, except they used the word dazzle. Like that, that's exactly what happened when they went to that restaurant at Port Angeles. She just changed the word dazzle to disarm. Oh, what lazy writing. And then he's like, well, you disarm me, Miss Steele. And she's like, oh, well, is that why you've changed your mind about us? And he's like, oh, look, um, I don't think I've changed my mind per se. We just need to redefine our parameters I want you submissive of my playroom and I'll punish you if you digress from the rules. But other than that, stuff is up for discussion. And so then she agrees on the condition that she gets to sleep in his bed with him. And that's that. I thought she had a whole list of things that she did want to do. The only condition she got in was that she wants to sleep in his bed. She's the best negotiator in town though, remember? And then she says, I love that you want more. And he says, I know. And she says, how do you know? And he says, trust me, I just do. And then he's smirking. And she thinks he's hiding something. What? And that's important for later. So just flag that in your little heads. And then poor Leandra arrives with breakfast and their conversation ceases because she remembers how ravenous she is. And then she says, oh, can I, can I pay? And Christian's like, yeah, nah. And she's like, come on, I want to pay. And he's like, are you trying to completely emasculate me? Ugh, I don't get that. When I'm at lunch with my friends who are girls, if they want to pay, I say, thank you. (laughs) I'm not putting up a fight. Like, how is it emasculating? It's so offensive to presume that you're emasculated just because a woman's paying for your meal. Get over yourself, Christian. And also, Anna, you're at an IHOP. What's it going to cost? Like 23 bucks, 50? He just paid for your first class ticket to Georgia, but nah, nah, you buy him a pancake. But nah, he shoots it down. He says, nope, I'm paying. And then they leave. He drops her off at her mum's home. And she thinks, oh, I never actually told him my mum's address, but oh, well, I guess he stalked me. And she just shrugs that off. And she invites him in and he's like, nah, I got to work. And she feels really disappointed. And she's like, why am I so disappointed? And she goes, oh yes, because I've fallen in love with him and he can fly. She's talking like he's Superman. He can fly. Like, no, he just hired a plane. So that she goes inside and her mum's in a flat preparing dinner for Christian that night. And she's like, oh, we went gliding. And her mum says, gliding? 
as in a small plane with no engine. That sort of gliding. <laughs> like, okay. All right, Carla with the definitions. She didn't have to look that one up. She was like, oh, gliding, I'm aware of it. It's a small plane with no engine, of course. <laughs> All right, Carla. Encyclopedia Brown. And then she says, wow. And then she's speechless. And Well, no, she's not speechless if she just said, wow. Like, honestly. Gliding as in a small plane with no engine. Wow. Next sentence. She's speechless. <laughs> no, no, she's not. She's categorically not. So then they chat about how last night went with her going up to the hotel room. Da 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 da. And then she sends Christian an email to say thanks. And she says soaring as opposed to saw dash ing, as in feeling sore from spanking. And she says thanks. Sometimes you really know how to show a girl a good time. And then he responds saying, I'll take either of those over you snoring. So soaring, soaring, snoring. Haha, <laughs> banter. Then she's writing back in all caps, I do not snore. And it's very ungallant of you to point it out. And then he responds being like, all right, shouty capitals. And he says, no, you don't snore, but you do talk and it's fascinating. And she thinks, holy shit. I know I talk in my sleep. Kate has told me enough times. What the hell have I said? Oh no. So then she sends him an email with a subject, spill the beans. <laughs> and she's saying, okay, what did I say? No kisses for you until you talk. And then he responds being like, yeah, I'm not telling you. And she's fuming. She thinks, right, exclamation mark. I shall maintain radio silence until this evening. And then she's thinking, geez, what if I've said I've hate him or that I love him in my sleep? And this is why he had that green at IHOP, by the way, just call back to that. When she was thinking, what's he hiding? He was hiding the knowledge of what she said in her sleep. So she's fuming, but then they've got to make dinner for tonight. So her mum's making gazpacho and then her... Her stepdad's going to grill up some meat. And they're at the shops, apparently, just shopping for these ingredients. And she's browsing the raw meat cabinet. What a horrible way to phrase it, the raw meat cabinet. Can you just say the meat section? But as she's browsing the raw meat cabinet, her phone rings and she scrambles for it. And she thinks it's Christian, but it's not. It's Elizabeth Morgan from SIP. You know, the publishing house she interned for, the small one with the boho chic vibe. So they're offering her the job of assistant to Mr. Jack Hyde. And she says, great, I'll start work on Monday. And then she's beaming at her mum. She tells her mum and she's like, congrats, we'll have to get some champagne. And she's clapping her hands and jumping up and down in the middle of the supermarket. And Anna thinks, is she 42 or 12? Which is a bit mean. Let your mum celebrate the fact that you got a job, like far out. And then she notices that there's a missed call on her phone from Christian. So she calls him and he's like, oh, hey, I have to go back to Seattle. Something's come up. Please apologize to your mum. I'm already on my way to the airport. And he sounds very businesslike, apparently. And she's like, oh, nothing serious, I hope. And he says, I've got a situation I need to deal with. I'll see you on Friday. I'll get Taylor to collect you from the airport. And she's like, all right, have a safe flight. And then she's like, oh, no, the last situation he had was my virginity. Jeez, I hope it's nothing like that. No, of course it's not. Why would his business be in peril because someone he's met hasn't had sex before? Like, no, Anna. She's just, she's so dumb. Oh, and then the longest chapter in the world's still going. Her and her mum are lying besides the pool. And her mum's super relaxed now that Mr. Megabucks isn't coming to dinner. And so she's just sunbaking, thinking about Christian. She's like, oh, there's something that's changed in his attitude, but I don't know what it is. And she's thinking, what's he done after he wrote that long email to me? What's different? And then she realizes he had dinner with her, Elena. And she thinks, holy fuck. She's thinking, what did she say to him? And she thinks, oh, to have been a fly on the wall during their dinner. I could have landed in her soup or on her wine glass and choked her. (laughs) Um, Well, if you were a fly landing in soup, then you'd drown, sweetie. Like what? Why would you want to be in that situation? But she goes into a full-blown tiz. She's like, oh no, what did I say in my sleep? What did she tell him? Should I ask him about it? Should I ask him what he said to her? So she sends him a passive aggressive email with the subject, safe arrival, question mark. And it pretty much just says, hey, let me know if you're home safe. I'm beginning to worry. And then three minutes later, he sends an email back saying, yes, I've arrived. Sorry, I didn't let you know. It's cute that you were worried about me. And she responds being like, I hope your situation is okay. P.S. Are you going to tell me what I said in my sleep? 
And he's like, no, the situation is not yet resolved. And no, I'm not going to tell you what you said in your sleep. So yes, he's just said, hey, situation's still ongoing. We're at battle stations here. And so she responds saying, I hope it was amusing, (laughs) but I can't take any responsibility for what I said out of my mouth while I'm asleep. Bitch, no one cares. He doesn't care what you said in your sleep. It was probably nothing. Get over it. And then there's more banter. He's just refusing to tell her. And so she's sending back emails with the subject line, grr. And he's like, okay, wildcat. And she thinks, oh, he can be so exasperating sometimes. 50 shades of exasperating. So then she clambers into bed. But then she gets one final email from Christian. And he says, I'd rather hear you say the words that you uttered in your sleep when you're conscious. That's why I won't tell you. Go to sleep. I'll talk to you tomorrow. And she thinks, oh no, what have I said? It's as bad as I think, I'm sure. And I think the implication is that you said you loved him in your sleep. Or you said, no, I don't want to eat strawberries. Get the strawberries away from my face. You fuck with. It's one or the other. (laughs) And the long chapter was finally over. So, wow. If you've got any thoughts, hit me up. Send me a tweet to at podbreakingdown or an email to breakingdownpod at gmail.com. You can hit me up on breakingdownbadbooks.com for all the links and all the other stuff. And I'll see you next time for more of the same nonsense. Bye. This is Unsighted, the internet's least reliable English lit podcast. I'm Chantal. And I'm Amy. And we're two reformed English majors. And former roommates. We discuss literary works we read in our undergrad and beyond. Come hang out with us while we chat about the books, plays, short stories, and poems that we loved. And, um... Love less. Look up Unsighted, an English lit podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And here's a short clip from our episode on The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. And then he says, Though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. And here's where he's afraid of death. Right. But I don't think he's actually afraid of death. I think he's just afraid of, like, he'll get to the end of his life and it will have all not meant anything. Yeah, I think he's afraid of not living to the fullest. I think he has FOMO and a bit of not enough YOLO. Yes, that's exactly what he has. He's all FOMO, no YOLO. (laughs) 